have you with us here in New Zealand and join us for our final farewell of Pukekohe Park Raceway. Today marks the end of an era of this iconic circuit. Just two more sprint races left and then Supercars says goodbye to a track that has bred some of our very best drivers. The New Zealand fans have turned out in force. It is officially a sellout and the energy and the atmosphere is unrivaled. And they will be on their feet this afternoon with local hero Shane Van Gisbergen starting from the pole position for race 28 of the championship. It's going to be a thrilling opening stanza. And as the cars head out to the grid, let's cross to Chaz Mostert. He'll start out of position five for this one. Hey, Chazzy, congratulations on a great qualifying result. You just missed out on the podium here yesterday. What's your plan for the opening laps? Yeah, hey guys, um, I'm not too sure. I'm starting a little bit further back today, being fifth, which is not ideal, but um, yeah, different day today, that's for sure, with the, the track conditions a little bit warmer. Um, so we'll just have to see if tyre degradation has anything in store today. So I think we'll probably have to, to look about trying to um, get track position early and then go from there. Hey, Chazzy, how are you enjoying the crowd and the atmosphere here this weekend? Oh, it's unreal. It's, to be honest, it's really disappointing we're not going to come back here because this is one of those real cool old school tracks which actually has viewing from the main straight pretty much the whole track. So um, anyone designing a new track needs to have those things in mind. But here, the history, uh, you can't go past it. So um, I hope the Aussies can get one up over the New Zealander because uh, it's always pretty fun doing that. So we'll see how this race goes. Thanks for joining us. Have a great run this afternoon. Oh, you have a great run this afternoon too. We sure will. We cannot wait to go racing here at Pukekohe. For all of today's race considerations, though, let's jump into the Hino Hub with Neil Crompton. Jess, it's a great vibe out there. So let's have a look at what we're dealing with this afternoon in the Hino Hub and unpack some of the detail around the two races that we're going to see today. We've already detailed and talked a lot about what a wonderful racetrack this is. You know, back in 1963, when they designed this track, risk was a prerequisite. And then the fun police turned up, unfortunately. We've lost these sort of racetracks and we're losing a special one today. 41 laps the journey. It is a full-blown sprint race. And we're going to see it twice this afternoon and just a little under 120 kilometres which does make them a bit tight on fuel around here. Very, very long pit lane. Transit is 46 seconds. One compulsory stop for two wheels and tyres. If you want to be classified, and we saw some people working to that yesterday, after damage, you have to have achieved 31 laps. Now, in terms of passing and hot spots, one to four, it's alive with all of those things. You can pass, and there's also a huge risk opportunity down there if things go wrong. Five and eight, well, you can pass up the inside at five. Look for that. And, of course, there's always action at the hairpin, particularly on the opening lap down there at turn eight. And just this corner, I'd just stand up there for a week to watch a supercar go around because it is awesome. These are the blokes that have been successful in the recent past. So this place is all about confidence, and you've got to have the car to be able to do the job that you need to do in these high-confidence zones. And the commitment commitment required through the final complex and down off turn one is unbelievable but if you get it wrong risk reward consequences here are extreme we've already seen cars up against the concrete walls and they don't have much in the way of spare parts because it's a flyaway event if anything does go wrong i want to make this point because you're going to see traffic congestion out there in this race so keep an eye out it's a 63 to 64 second lap round here when you race but you saw the transit time plus the stationary time don't have to be very far back before you tangle up in traffic. So when you feed back out and who you race with is very important. We didn't see this thing in evidence much in the recent past, but we did pop out yesterday after the trouble for Macca down there. So it's only a medium rating for the BP Ultimate Safety Car. We may get one today. I've just got a feeling from a, the point of view of intuition that it's going to be pretty wild out there because everybody up and down here is G'd up to win the JR Trophy and eventually someone's going to win the last supercar race here. The weather out there at the moment is gorgeous. I popped outside a tick ago. The sun is shining. Buckle up. Get your favourite beverage. This is going going to rock. The man that will start today's race from pole position local hero, Shane Van Gisbergen. Shane, we saw the emotion after you finished the lap that put you on pole for this race. Just run us through how special this one is. Oh, I'm just stoked with that lap. We've really been struggling and um, it's been a tough weekend. So the last race is going to be tough, but I've got to enjoy this one up the front. I was pretty pumped with that lap and then we just couldn't quite replicate it in the last one. But hopefully get a good start. Got my teammate beside me. He's driving awesome. So, yeah, hopefully we can put on a show. You guys had a pretty aggressive strategy in yesterday's race. Went for three tyres and tried for the big run home. Have you learned anything from that to try and do something a bit different today? Probably do two tyres today and then maybe try three in the, in the last race again. But 
got to try and keep the track position because as soon as you follow someone, you lose the front grip. So we've got to keep the air on the nose and try and stay out front. Thanks, Shane. Good luck. Cheers. We've got the blue cars on the front row, the red cars on the second row today. Will Davison, winner yesterday. How important is it for you to get in, at least in front of one of those cars ahead of you on this first lap? Well, of course it's important, but uh, we'll just do what we can do. It's, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting, that's for sure. It's sort of um, team versus team. So strategically, the race is going to be fascinating. As we saw yesterday, a lot of the cars pitting early were sort of interfering quite a lot with the race. So we're not sure how we're going to play it, but clearly the first lap is important and everything will be dictated from that. You've had great support from the local fans here today, but they probably want to see a Kiwi win. Are you ready to break some Kiwi hearts? They can hear you right now. <laughs> Hey, may the best man win, um, and uh, that's what it's all about. They just want us here to race hard, and that's what we'll do. So looking forward to it. Best of luck in this one, mate. Cheers. Beautiful scenes. Start of the grid with a Red Bull lockout on row one, followed by a Shell V-Power lockout on row two. And what will happen down to turn one? Can young Brock Feeney get off the line and get around the outside of SVG? Or can Will Davison do a start like he did yesterday and get down the inside of SVG? There's going to be plenty to play out. It's roughly 250 metres from the front row of the grid to the turn-in point at turn one. And how is the fan patronage here today? It is just so great to be back in New Zealand celebrating supercars in this place. Auckland is the place that we all fly into and where we go racing is roughly 45 minutes south of there, Bukakoi Park Raceway. It's famous. And on behalf of Pizza Hut, this is the layout. 2.9K, it's super fast, it's super bumpy. And Neil Crompton covered it before on the Hino Hub. It's got risk and reward. Massive consequences for making a mistake, especially coming onto the straight or off the straight. Big, fast corners. The drivers love it. We absolutely, over the years, since the mid-60s, when the world's best drivers arrived here in the Tasman Series, everybody has loved it. We love the character. We love the bumps. We love the speed. We love the risk and we Two love minutes. the amount of commitment required to do a good job here. And this man, Van Gisbergen, that qualifying lap before, I have not seen him so emotional, fist pumping in the car after that lap to be able to put it onto pole position. It was extraordinary. And he just knocked off his young teammate, Brock Feeney, who, who came here this weekend as a rookie. He's obviously not a rookie, but that was a great performance by Brock. Will Davison. And Anton Di Pasquale, second row of the grid. Chas Mostert, we were just talking to him. Jess was saying on the way to the grid, what are your chances? He's a little bit further back than he would like. But as we know, Chas never gives up. Cam Waters and David Reynolds, seven and eight. Brody Kostecki, Andre Heimgartner, he's further back than I expected. He did a brilliant job yesterday, the young Kiwi, to finish on the podium. Jake Kostecki, very nice job to be 11th alongside James Golding in position 12. Jack LeBrock, 13. Nick Perkat, who's actually gone better this weekend than he's been going. That's not as good as he would like in qualifying in 14th. He'll come through the field. He's a great racer. Bryce Fullwood and Mark Winterbottom, 15 and 16. Macaulay Jones has been fast this weekend. He had a drama yesterday with James Golding and was out of the race. Lee Holdsworth, who's just announced his full-time retirement. He's done a great job for us over the 500 races in the series. Will Brown and Thomas Randall, 21 and 22. A couple of young charges at the back. They always come through. Jack Smith, he's got a celebration in the next event this afternoon. We'll cover that for you later. James Courtney, that's the worst qualifying of Pukekohe ever for James Courtney. And another New Zealander rounds out the field of the Commodore, Chris Pitha. I can't wait for this start. Neil Crompton's just come back into the commentary box. This is going to be on, Crompo. Very much looking forward to it, Mark. It'll be high levels of intensity when everybody focuses on the lights, drops the clutch Green and gets on with it. Formation lap now underway. It's a very important opportunity to get those temps and pressures right. Get those tyres up as much as you can, as early as you can. Get some brake temperature going as well. Let's get an update now from Mark Larkham in the lane. 
Coppo, you know, and you know as well as I do, mate, I actually think it's probably going to be genuinely nearly impossible to pass Shane Van Gisbergen on the track today. But there's two places where he can absolutely be beaten. One in the pit lane. We look closely at the in-laps, the out-laps, the stops. We saw yesterday Anton Di Pasquale came in here. Look at his witness marks on the ground here, where they got the air spike in early. He, did, he came in a little bit too hot. He ran long and did a very slow pit stop. Lost four stops. Down there, Andre Heimgartner did a beautiful stop picked up two spots. That's one place that Shane can be beaten or make gains. The other one, look at him out there sitting on pole position, right? For everything that Shane does that is nearly perfect. The thing that's probably not perfect in his game is he starts by his own admission. They're not bad. They're not always great. Think of the pressure of that sellout Pukekohe crowd sitting on that man's shoulders right now. Watch this start with great interest. He's got a bit to wrestle. And he's got 24 angry supercar drivers all around him that'll do absolutely whatever it takes to knock him off. And uh, there aren't too many of them out there at the moment that are interested in anything other than themselves. <laughs> they don't think they care too much about nationality. They certainly don't care about teammates. Century Batteries, Tech Facts. Brake rating around here very low. Bump rating high, particularly because of all the clobbering of the kerbs. Tire wear, well, yesterday there was no degradation at all. It's next to zero. In fact, we saw it when they put the three wheels and tyres on Shane's car. They sacrificed some stationary time to try and get some pace back on the racetrack. And even with the benefit of the safety car, there was nothing yielded much out of that. Turning time is significant around here. Crossover time's not going to matter because I don't believe it's going to rain. And it's 250 metres from the start of the starting grid as we pick up on Jamie Wincup to the turning point down there at turn one. So we've got, so we've got a couple of people who've got very fast race cars in and around the pole sitter as well. So we obviously celebrate who's on pole as Andrew brings Shane in. But remember that Brock Feeney and Will Davison had cars that you could barely measure the performance difference at the end of the lap, which means that they'll be quick. So Shane looking over there at Andrew, who he's really teamed up very well with in 2022. Ludo Lacroix heading back. Remember, that's a new driver-engineer partnership in this Repco Championship season, and it's been a very successful one. And Andrew spent many years at Brad Jones Racing successfully. If you're looking down the side of the Shell V-Power Racing Mustang, feel just about in position. We're going to get an all-clear here. New Zealand echoes to the sound of supercars one more time. ITM Auckland Super Sprint race number two of the weekend and away they go. Very good start by Van Gisbergen. Mostert is blazing up the inside. He's displaced a shell car. And Brock has dropped the spot, gone back into third position, but Van Gisbergen's done a very good job of ticking off one of the most important boxes of this race, and he leads them onto the back straight. Very brave manoeuvre. Will Davison around the outside of Brock Pooney. Got the Shell Mustang into P2. Huge pressure on Ben Gisbergen now. They're all bumping each other down the back straight. And he has a little look, Davison. He knows he's got to put a move on early if he's going to get it done. Now Anton is drifting back in the pack here significantly, so he's got on. Oh, he's gone in. Trouble. He's been turned and whacked the wall. Game over for Di Pasquale. Does he survive this? Just. Left rear is uh, broken. Left rear is broken. No good for Anton Di Pasquale. Tangled and fired into the fence, and that's going to be a big job this afternoon. Significant damage on that car as Mostert covers on the run to turn one. He's got a shallow line there that makes him vulnerable to Feeney, and we've got safety car. Safety no car. surprise. The leader is car 97. So there's going to be a lot of rubbish on the road there. He was already swamped by a oh. heap of cars, so something had gone wrong there. So maybe it had some steering damage or there's some other interruption. But as he came out of the chicane complex, he was really scratching and all of a sudden ended up eating the wall down there. So something weird happening into turn five and six. And uh, Will Brown, I didn't realise what had happened to Will. Did you see? No, I didn't see him go in there at all because it wasn't his car involved yeah, in the Anton okay. thing. 
that's a separate incident there because what well, actually unfolded before was Brody Kostecki with Anton Di Pasquale. So that's a completely different thing. Yes, I, I, but, I wonder whether it, but I wonder whether or not it dates back further. So uh, this might tell us some of the stories. So Di Pasquale checks up behind Reynolds, Heimgartner, and then there's just an interlock here between Brody and Anton. I thought he was going to be collected by the rest of the field here. And that car is pretty seriously bruised there at the moment. Oh. So Van Gisbergen got an excellent start. The initial jump didn't look that great, but the secondary portion of it was very good, and away he went. In fact, I don't think any of the front guys got a good start. So... That Feeney all line of stern down there into the hairpin because Shane was covering. Have a look at the damage on car 11. That is massively hurt. So on board now. So that's David Reynolds. And then a little bump with Heimgarten. And then on your right, you'll see Brody. We well, don't actually see him because he's just back behind the vision that we can show you. And on to your point, I thought the guys have done a great job to miss a spinning Anton Di Pasquale who was going to come back into the field. I thought for sure there'd be other cars that would collect him. He poked it back into first gear to try and sneak it around the left-hander at turn six. Um, and I think it was Reynolds. Oh, off radio, mate. Were you out of the car? I'm just running the replay in my own head. And it was Reynolds that had run pretty wide down there at five. And in the process, that car had Anton even wider. But I, I haven't fully unpacked the thoughts on why he started to drift so far. So there must have been trouble down there at turn four that I wasn't on to. I think so, yeah. And, and this one is a modern mystery. Totally. So but, Will Brown's car, the Boost Mobile entry, and uh, that's at Pit Inn with pretty significant looking damage. So under investigation, uh, the incident at turn six, lap one, confirmed by race control between 11 and 99. Well, there's no surprise there between Anton this and This race Brody. has been suspended. Red flag, this race is suspended. All cars to the grid, Pete. So, race suspended, all cars to the grid. Well, that's interesting because, I mean, it looks like Anton's car, that one's easily collected, but the damage to the pit entry, maybe, yeah. where Will Brown's parked, is the reason that race control has made this decision. And there must be significant damage to first line of protection or whatever that might be we can't really see it from the shot we had before I'm tipping that the something to do with the pit lane entry is not right and uh, obviously in the not too distant future if it were if the cars were released once again and we go green they'll they'll be trying to get back into the pit lane for those that have either got some damage or want to do the compulsory stop so there must be something going on there we'll get confirmation for it but it, i think that the pit lane entry has been compromised and we'll find out more about that and uh, obviously we've got a great reporting team in the pit lane that'll get on top of the job. So Shane Van Gisbergen... You've got it. You just, what you just said is exactly right. So the wall's been shifted and it has impacted the ability to get into the pit lane. So we've got to correct that before we can recommence. So Shane would have thought, happy days, we've got this so first up. little thing sorted, which is <laughs> get started. Mark Larkin was asking... In, and uh, posing the question as to whether that was going to work okay for him. But uh, he got off the line okay. As, as you said, there was nobody made a blinder, but um, he was the best of the worst. And he got down to turns two, three, four, and uh, strong enough to be able to lead them onto the back straight. And that's the only thing that eventually matters. And uh, looking at the back of Will Brown's car here. So a very long pit lane entry. We they do they... not have an operator operational pit lane at this stage. The pit wall has been compromised. We have a non-operational pit entry road. And that's the race director uh, in the background. So that's the reason for this. That worries me looking at that image because we've we've talked a bit already this weekend about the fact that it's a flyaway event. They don't have the benefit of the normal race transporters, which are effectively mobile workshops with every conceivable component, nut, bolt, washer and everything in between that's required to do the job. OK, not right. only has it been compromised, it's out at 45 degrees right at the apex of that turn. Now, those things are a couple of ton. Yeah, so the, so blo the block itself, the, that block, the first one there, roughly four metres long, they're four ton. Yeah, but what yeah. be it begs the question, 
how hard did Will hit that in order to be able to do it? So that's that's a serious, like that that's a ridiculous amount of speed that he's carried in there to be able to move that thing. Exactly. Now we have seen because your close friend Brad Jones, is, when he went into that fence before, I think we saw Fabian in there at yeah. a different time, but we haven't seen him in there at that extremity. So I think what's happened coming out of the hairpin, Will would have tried to get around the outside of another car and has made it to the grass and then had to fire into there. So some other circumstance has prevailed to put that car in that position. I'm here with Barry Ryan from Erebus and everyone's looking at the screens down here, Baz, but you guys seem none the wiser as to what's happened. Could you deduce anything with Tom looking at the data? No, not at all. We're just concerned about Will because we haven't heard from him. So. Um, it looks like he's hit the wall pretty right, hard and right, right, there's right. no radio communication. So fingers crossed he's all right because no one's told us anything. So we're just trying to work out whether he's all right and we don't care about the car or the wall or the race. We just need to know he's all right. So. OK, well, I heard from the producers that he's out of the car. Oh, is he? All right, that's good. Because we hadn't heard anything or hadn't seen anything. So, yeah, anyway, we'll, we'll see what happened. They haven't even showed us what happened yet. So, um, yeah, hopefully he's all right. And that's the main thing. OK, thanks, mate. No worries. Now, thinking about the fact that we're in New Zealand here and we bring everything out here on aeroplanes, 747s actually, and we've got all these containers out here, my instant thought, are they going to have the bits? Because you can look at that car. I see the damaged wing was the thing that worried me most. Wing end plates, boot, bars, because they only bring a couple of front bars and one rear bar. So straight away, DJR, they're out here. This is one of their containers, 3,000 kilos of kit in that. You can see all in these nicely made covers. They've got two sets of panels for every car, for both cars they need here. Lots of bars, lots of bits and pieces. But first thing I ask, have you got a wing? And yes, they have got a wing. So that's already gone in there. So well organised, just enough bits. But now if they have another incident, then they're going to be in a world of pain. Yeah, so there's a very um, detailed list of componentry that you're permitted to be able to bring. And there's obviously weight constraints when you're bringing these cars across the Tasman air freighted across in a couple of aircraft so there's an enormous number of components in there to be able to get the job done but by comparison to what you would normally bring with you when you are on the road and you know if it's a Gold Coast or a Melbourne based team where other than Brad Jones racing everybody's either based in southeastern Queensland or down in Melbourne you go to somewhere like Perth or you go to Darwin you can't just nick around the corner and get these very highly specialized components at the click of a finger so the transporters have got almost everything you could possibly imagine They're effectively a mobile workshop so you don't have that same depth one of the things that is good the industry eats itself alive competitively and politically however when these incidents happen they're actually very good at sharing and so often other teams come to the rescue and we've also seen some great examples of that over the years yeah that is a really good point it's a real level of cooperation with competition and the industry is very, very close away from all that. There's a real camaraderie, isn't there, Brianna? Dave Reynolds, you started this race from position number eight. Are you able to, to give us any insight on just how chaotic that opening lap was? Uh, yeah, that was really nuts. There was a lot of chaos, but um, yeah, I think I made my, way, made my way through. I got a little bit of damage on my car, but it's not too bad. I uh, just hope the guys that are hit the fence, they're OK. And just give us a bit of an insight into what happens now for you as a driver, for the mechanics, for your engineers in this period that we've got with the red flag. Yeah, so obviously for the drivers, if you're dying for a piss before the race, now you can go take one, thank thankfully for the red flag. But the boys just trying to cool the car. Um, you know, I think you can do setup changes now, but I don't, don't know how that will go. But, you know, we didn't do enough racing laps to figure out if our car's any good. But, you know, we're just waiting for the race to get underway. Thank you, Dave. Probably be a bit. Thank you. Just next door, I found Bruce Stewart and pretty good start from Chaz Mostert on that one. Your thoughts on that opening lap from Chaz? Yeah, it was really encouraging. He came up on the inside and made a couple of spots and then, you know, I think um, settled back into fourth, but made one late into third as well. Um, but clearly, you know, the concern is for everyone in the crash and making sure they're OK. You know, uh, I will and, uh, you know, uh, Anton are going OK. And, you know, obviously that's pretty severe damage, so... Um, you know, the crew's going to have to work hard to get those back, but um, this is a collaborative kind of sport and I'm sure we'll do what we can to see uh, them through to Bathurst and put on a great show. But, yeah, good start from us. Early days, though, Chad. Like, not going to write too much into it. As the boss, how do you sort of gather the troops in a scenario like this and get everyone's mind focused on the job when we get back to racing? Well, I think uh, everyone, we've got a lot of experienced heads in there in our, in our pit and uh, they know how to corral the troops. So I'm really lucky that 
Uh, I don't have to lead with an iron fist. I've got leaders all throughout this team and that they take control. And uh, to be honest, uh, I just watch it from the, from afar. And, um, yeah, I'm really, really lucky. You've got a great team. OK, thanks, mate. Good on you, mate. Thank you. Uh, down here at pit entry, and I can just, you can come down here, you can see how far this concrete block moved. That's a good two metres how much that concrete block moved. When I got down here, the first thing I saw was the rear window out of Will Brown's car on this side of the fence. So Bill's car's on the back of the tow truck. It's actually going to make its way down pit lane now, but there's significant damage to the uh, right side of the Will Brown number nine Erebus Commodore. He wasn't here when we got here, so he'd already left and gone to the medical centre. So hopefully great news that Will got out of the car OK. We'll just stay because that car's on its way here. You'll get a good shot of the damage as the car comes past. So the crew here doing an awesome job rebuilding the tyre barrier so that we can get the fences already back into position, getting the tyre barrier fixed up. Here comes Will Brown's car. It's actually on the other side, but I'll quickly whip around if I can and a significant damage all the way down the side of that car. It looks like the right rear has been pushed in really, really hard. So big job ahead of the Erebus boys to try and get that out for the next one. Anton Di Pasquale's car is making his way in too. And pretty much all four corners of that car with big, big damage also. So guys are doing a good job here on the repair. Hopefully we'll be back racing again shortly. Anton Di Pasquale back in the garage now. First of all, mate, you're OK? It's a fairly big hit. Uh, yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Yeah, decent enough hit. Um, we'll see. The boys have a good crack at fixing it. Uh, yeah, no good to start your Sunday. No, your team's well into it, mate. They're straight into your parts out here. First of all, trying to understand that, looking at the vision, I, I can't even yet quite make sense of it. It looks like you guys... It doesn't look like anyone, did, like anyone did anything particularly wrong. Your wheel's interlocked. There's a bit of this, and then you're turned and gone. Um, yeah, I haven't seen the footage. Um, yeah, just kept going right. There you go. You can have a look at that right now. Let's have a look. So... It, it, it does, to me, it doesn't look like anything intentional happened. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's hard to say from here, you know. We'll, uh, we'll look at it later, but for now, we'll worry about the next race and uh, move on. Yeah, it's a bit of a shame you've got good pace here and you're on the second row for the next one, so best of luck for that, mate. Yeah, cheers, thanks. And as you can see from the pictures here, a fair bit of work going on with Brody Kostecki's car. Brody, I know that your focus is on, of course, your teammate and, and getting this car repaired as well. Just give us your insights from that opening lap. Yeah, it was uh, a bit sort of crazy. Um, we're sort of just a bit of a passenger through five and six. Um, I think um, one of the Penrite cars ran um, Anton off and then um, it was just sort of four cars trying to go into one. And um, yeah, Anton sort of just come across my nose and um, just ripped the wheel out of my hands. and. Um, so it seems to done a fair bit of damage and obviously a fair bit of damage to him as well. So it's a, you know, a bit of a bummer for the first lap and um, then obviously come around and saw Will on the fence and I'm um, not really sure how he's going, but hopefully he's all right. Um, he's a tough little tacker, so um, he should be up for the next one, hopefully. As we can see, the boys getting getting hard to work at the moment, just ensuring that this car gets back out there when we get racing again. Yeah, yeah, it should be right. Um, we'll see how it goes. It, it was uh, a few things were clicking and banging, so um, yeah, we'll see how it goes once we've changed a few things and um, yeah, just see how we end up in this one. Appreciate it. Thanks, Brody. Thank you. So Brody Kostecki was in car number 99, the Boost Mobile car, the sister car to this one driven by Will Brown. So Brody, you saw in the thick of that battle, he qualified in ninth position and he was battling with David Reynolds and uh, Andre Heimgartner and uh, both heavily damaged cars. But uh, our focus and interest is on what's going on with Will Brown, who qualified in 21st. And Mark and I were talking while the interviews were going and if you do get a hip and shoulder from somebody on the run into turn one, which has happened plenty of times before, you will fire off at very high speed there. But we haven't figured out who the perpetrators were or whether it was some, maybe there was a puncture or something of that nature and Will's gone off on his own. But he has gone off from that area in the background. So you, you come out from underneath that sign at a very, very high rate of speed. It's a 65 kilometre an hour corner, the preceding hairpin at turn eight. And then you build, 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 build speed all the way into nine and 10 well north of 200 kilometres an hour. So was he pushed or was there another failure? But if you even get the lightest of touches there, you will fire off at very high speed. Larko, give us an update, please. Yeah, Quampo, let's have a look at this car as they're unloading it. So, you know, panel damage doesn't worry me too much. That's the easy stuff to fix. We've got to look for the structural issues. Now, this bar, not damage itself, but the mounts, it's pushed back hard. So mounts, that's a bit of a drama to change, a little bit of work. I see fluid. I think that's, no, that's just water, so fluid's OK. This wheel's had a big knock. That looks OK, but it's had a big knock, so there may be some structural damage in behind there. But come down the back here, Stu, if you could. Let's, I'll drag my camera guy with me down the back here. This is my biggest concern. Look at this. Wow. 
that's copped a big hit. So we've got some pretty serious, I can't see it under there, some pretty serious rear end damage there. Let's come around the back. This is the wing I was talking about. Now I can see the lower thing, that's all damaged. Wing is definitely damaged. That would have pulled the threads out of the end of the wing. So that's need to be replaced. This is going to be an awkward fix. Look at this rear three quarter panel here. What we call the C panel. Damage there. That's going to be a bit of an awkward one. This wheel has copped a big whack. So there's good good chance that's going to be bent in behind there. Sills, doors, that's all okay. Front right wheel again. This has copped a big whack. So all four wheels have literally, or three of the four wheels have copped a big whack. So this is going to need wheel aligning back on the setup patch. It's an awkward repair. Looks fairly simple. I think it's going to be quite complex. They'll be up against it. Yeah, it's, it's wishbones, it's uprights, it's anti-roll bars, it's brake rotors, it's hubs, it's all of the things that you can't see. What's it done to the transaxle? Um, we're going to find out when they strip it. They often look better when you get the dead componentry off them, but that is going to be a very big job this afternoon to try and Five rectify. Five minutes. So you heard the call in the background there for everybody to start making preparations to get race number 28 back underway once again. Shane Van Gisbergen having made a very good start and defended his pole position nicely all the way down to turn four and led them on to the back straight comfortably. He's got to go through the process one more time. Here's why we've got the stoppage, or at least part of the story, because we don't fully understand what happened to Will Brown. So Dave Reynolds ran pretty wide down there through the right-hander at five, and then Anton and Andre are jostling, and then it ends up being Brody and Anton side by side coming out of the left-hander. Here's the view from Anton's car, and they've tangled and it's fired Anton into the wall. So you can't see Brody at the moment. That's the little touch. That's serious contact. That's not going to be fixed in a hurry. When you hear that in the background, you know that there's a lot of underlying damage. Here's another view. So Anton's rotated around the nose of Kostecki, and uh, yet another view here off in the background. What are your thoughts? This is more stuff going on down here that we didn't catch. That's where Most had actually got the spot. So after all that kerfuffle, we didn't really follow what happened at the front, and Mostert was the beneficiary of everybody being banked up. In fact, I think Shane, he went full defensive and had the first three cars all line of stern on the inside of the road going into the hairpin. I think the thing about when Mark Larkin was just rolling us through the level of repair here, the thing that's complex about fixing this car is that every corner needs attention. That's the problem. Yeah, so if it was just a bit of damage on the front of whatever description, that's fine. But by the way that the car hit the fence awkwardly, turned back around, and then effectively collected each corner of the car as that accident was unfolding, that's where the workload comes in. You end up having to do quite a considerable amount of work on each corner of the car. So Shane Van Gisbergen, who would have had a big sigh of relief after that start, got through onto the back straight and thought that was OK. Mark, Mark Winterbottom, I'm sorry, just having some audio issues there. I know you want to focus on this race, but can you give us some insights from that opening lap? Yeah, uh, it was pretty crazy what was going on. Um, uh, obviously, when Deep Pasquale spun, all these guys did the cut through, um, and there was like four wide, uh, and then, yeah, Will's obviously come down the inside, but I think with interlock wheels, he's hit my right rear um, through that left-hander just after the hairpin, so, um, yeah, I hope he's OK, because that, that's a nasty spot, so... Um, uh, yeah, not sure exactly what happened, but I've got rubber on the right rear tyre, so I think we've interlocked and, um, yeah, nothing intentional, just a lot going on in that first lap. Yeah, absolutely. Really appreciate your insights. Thanks, Frosty. Yeah. And Todd Hazelwood also had a front row seat to what happened out there. Can you just talk us through the incident with Will Brown and what you saw, mate? Yeah, obviously there was a fair bit of action going on there, but, yeah, I'm not sure who Will was alongside to, but he was on the outside uh, swinging into turn 10, and then it looked like there was just a little bit of wheel-to-wheel -wheel contact, and that put him on the grass, and... When, when you're doing those sorts of speeds, you're a passenger. So, yeah, just uh, hope Will's doing OK. That's, uh, that's a fast part of the circuit. And yeah, when you see the ambulance on the track, it's never a good sign. So I hope he's all right. Okay, thanks, Todd. Good luck for the restart, mate. Yeah, cheers. Thank you. And that car looks pretty sore in the right rear corner as well. And that would be a high-speed impact. And 
because of the speed of the cars through that portion of the racetrack is up around a couple of hundred kilometres an hour. But the fact that that concrete block was moved best part of a metre plus, maybe more, Garth was down there describing it, that means he's gone in with a huge amount of pace. No doubt. So speed probably in excess of 200k. There's the witness mark. So he's made the grass. He was on the edge of the trap. So the trap actually hasn't been able to retard the car very much because he's, he's pretty much half on the grass rather than actually being in the sand trap. So by the time he got to the fence there, it hasn't been retarded and it's pushed that fence back further to Garth's reporting. It's a huge amount of force. Total personnel, 30 seconds. So we've got one clue at least. We know that, that it, he didn't go off on his own. It wasn't a breakage or a flat tyre, a puncture or anything like that. There, was, there were other parties involved. So uh, we'll get to the bottom of it as the day unfolds to try and understand it. And we're hoping to get an update to you very soon on Will Brown. Jess and I were talking to Will and Brody just prior to the start of the race. and. They were sort of feeling pretty good about life because they, were, they had a battle on their hands yesterday and safety they felt like they'd made some ground with the cars. And it's probably not beyond the realm's realism that Brody's car could be carrying bruises after interlocking so aggressively with Anton as well. Wouldn't be surprised at all if there's steering damage, geometry damage on car number 99, the Boost Mobile entry. Just a quick update from the Erebus garage on the condition of Will Brown. So we've got a text message that made its way back to the garage that Will is OK. He's at the medical centre. He was very heavily winded when he got out of the car. So he actually got himself out, laid down because he was winded. Certainly a big impact on the driver's side of the car. But he is OK and uh, hopefully back from the medical centre soon. Great. That's great news. Thanks, Garth. Important update. So popular character, Will Brown. He's got an effervescent smile and... Uh, very, very accomplished race driver, so he's hoping that he's OK and able to get back on the horse as quickly as possible and that car can be turned around. And otherwise, if not this weekend, we'll look forward to seeing him at the Repco Bathurst 1000. So, under control of the safety car now. Uh, there was a conversation between you, Jess and I earlier, Mark, about the relative speed between Van Gisbergen and Davison. Uh, I still sense, even with what we saw there, for only three quarters of a lap of racing. It still looks to me like Will Davis has got a pretty speedy mobile out there that's well and truly capable of running with Shane because Shane went into turn four with a fairly decent margin. By the time he got up the other end of the racetrack, I know it's cold tyres and very early days, he was right with him. Sort of get the sense that he's well and truly able to trade punches with him today. So that'll be interesting. Certainly will be. And based on both of their qualifying performances throughout the course of the weekend, you would have to say that Arguably, Davison's had the fastest car. Anton Di Pasquale on the tools. That's race always good to see to when teams, the drivers race get control involved. control to all teams. The CPS window will open for each car when it commences lap eight on the circuit. I repeat, the CPS window will open for each car when it commences lap eight on the circuit. James Taylor's the race director in Motorsport Australia Race Control and ably assisted this weekend by New Zealand Motorsport officials. So lap eight's been shifted from lap five. And that assumes that there's no further trauma. Gorgeous conditions out there today for supercar racing and slightly downbeat start when we see a couple of damaged cars like that and potentially a driver winded and hurt. Race control to safety car, maintain speed, 80 kph, lights out at 4.5, return to pit lane, this side, please. 4.5 is a reference point on the track map that all the teams receive from the officials pre-event. There's substantial briefing notes and they're added to through the course of the weekend, little things that matter about the operation of the event. So everybody works off those details, so including obviously all of the officials drivers are well briefed on this as well. There's substantial driver briefing notes. Safety car lights out, accelerating away from the field. Car 97, hold 80. And that there is 4.5, so it's between 4 and 5. And the message to everybody is that the lights are out. And from that point on, the lead car maintains the 80k. And maintain is the really key word there. So all the accelerating, jumping on the brakes, or the weaving from side to side must cease. And if you don't, you will be penalised. And we've seen people get penalised for that. And the go point where Shane Van Gisbergen can decide to do his own thing will be after this hairpin. There's the green 
flag, so he's got it all clear. He can regulate and decide when he wants to go. And he's waiting. And waiting. And he's got it spooled up. He'll have his right foot hard on the throttle. And his left foot hard on the brake. And he's like a torque converter and automatic. And he will, when he gets off the brake, he will go. And he's got the last moment. It's gamesmanship by Van Gisbergen at his finest. What does he do? When does he go? At the last possible meter, it looks like, is the answer to the question. They're all bottled up tight until they get virtually to the control line. And then he's got to go. So he's protecting himself into one and off he goes. So he waited till almost his grid box. So a very late restart. Fair amount of gamesmanship involved in all that. And he's got Will absolutely right with him on the run into turn four. Trips over the curb down here at three. Davison right there. Moston, who was able to negotiate all the messiness at the start up into third. Feeney back into fourth position. Under investigation, cars five and 55, gaining an advantage at the turn five chicane. Right. What it's done is it's punched the field up combo. That normal technique of getting off a restart like that would have opened the field up. What Shane did is close the field up. And now down the outside comes a very bold move by Davison. He's caught himself out. That's... I actually don't know why I did that down there. Well, he's vulnerable now to Cam Waters up on the outside. It's released Chaz Mostert into the party here as well. And Davison's going to drop another spot in the process. So he's gone high and wide. And we've got, I think it was Feeney off the road over the top of the hill. So with them all bunched up, there's a bit of weirdness playing out here at the moment in New Zealand. We've got Van Gisbergen leading by a third of a second. Mostert is now well in the game. And Will Davison's been shuffled back into fourth position. Now, I don't know whether Shane backed it off a little bit and let Will down the outside, or Will did that by himself. It would be really interesting to see the data, whether Shane acted, he just in terms of his gamesmanship, whether he moved it over the right and come out of the front a little bit and allowed Will down the outside, because it was such a bold move. And it makes Davis vulnerable to the next group that are chasing him, and then that's exactly what unfolded now. Another important message has come up. No further action. Lap one, turn six between De Pasquale and Brody Kostecki. So there's nothing further to answer on that one. So that's been confirmed. So half a second margin now, then. Five, five and 55 have got five second penalties. That's the reason why I called. Five and half 55. So Courtney and Randall are being penalised. They've gone straight through today. Is that what happened? Oh. And this is Jack Smith getting a hip and shoulder down there. It's all going on at this. Remember I said in the heat, I listen to this. He backed it off for sure. Absolutely. He can't just accelerate past another car like that. Yeah, and then in this process here, so he just lost that. He got a huge wheel spin. He fed it back to first gear in the right-hander at eight. I think that was strategic from Shane. So he's done a pretty smart job there as Brock runs wide over the top of the hill. So he's backed it out early, which he can do down the inside of the road. That effectively, because of the pressure that Will's under from behind, that forces him to the outside. Now, if he can make it work, whoa. So that was... Todd Hazelwood running wide down there on the grass. And that's been designed, that chicane, to be able to control the cars down there so that you can't gain an advantage, which we've seen previously here as well. So Shane ducking to the inside, making Will go the long way, left him vulnerable, poked it in first gear, got wheel spin, then started to cop a bashing from whoever was around him at the time, Cam Waters, and uh, dropped a couple of spots. Brock Feeney who's gone from the front row of the grid to 10th. He's been bashed up in the opening stanza of this race. He ended up being pushed off the road at the top of the hill and was out in the grass halfway along the pit straight. There's a fair bit of playing for keeps going on in the opening lap of the suspended race and pretty much at the restart as well. And because Shane kept it bottled up and bottled up all the way, until he got virtually back to his pole position in the slot. They were all over the top of each other. Whoa. 
Oh, now, that, oh that's what you just point. saw there with Perkett on the outside is what would have been unfolding with Will Brown earlier in the race. And you can imagine, folks at home, if you've got a little tap on, you're group limited in that part of the racetrack, you'll career across the grass. And that's why I met up with the pit lane entry down there. So that's Brody Kostecki, car number 99. So drag feeding in to get him out of the traffic. So early stop, we heard race control tell us that the new CPS was the commencement of eight. So feeding in. And that's probably pretty clever from 10. Trying to give him some clear air now after getting swamped in the opening phase of the race. So I think that was working side tyres on that car. So Van Gisberg has got the fastest lap of the race. And oh, oh Tim I'm Slade I'm carted awkwardly wide. It looked like race a slow mo nightmare. All teams, race control all teams, pit lane penalty drive through car 18 for a driving infringement. So PLP for Mark Winterbottom on Will Brown, I believe. So obviously they've been able to get hold of the information at race control and they've been able to get the data or get vision or get both. And it's Mark Winterbottom who gets the PLP for sending Will Brown down there at, off at high speed. Well, and we're going to try and obviously get that information for you as soon as we can in terms of the vision. So, Pit lane penalty confirmed by Motorsport Australia. Mark Winterbottom, a driving infringement. He's trundling down the pit lane as I speak. David Reynolds and Jack Smith in as well. So there's more to the story. We'll get the pictures and we'll share it with you as soon as we can. A bit going on here. I'm trying to sort of just understand who's doing what to who because we also saw Tim Slade pointing in the wrong direction down there. So this is a wild battle involving Thomas Randall and Todd Hazelwood. Chris Pither. Kiwi mixed up in this in the coat car. Now, wasn't Randall the one pushing Tim Slade around? It I, think like he, it. I think he was, yeah. and I, but I thought there might have been another car into the back of Randall at the same time. So there was a concertina effect down there at the hairpin. Scott Pye in now. He's done a good job. Jake Kostecki's also come into the pit lane, and here he is in the foreground. Trading entry. And he's done a good job. He was eighth before that. He'd make, he'd make ground. They uh, remember yesterday they released that car with the left rear wheel disconnected and they got 30 team points and fifteen hundred dollars for their trouble at Tickford on that one. And it's the replay of what happened with Thomas Randall and Tim Slade. That was a walking pace incident in the end, wasn't it? It was. And I, I just don't know is that it wasn't the car that I originally thought behind, it's actually Macaulay Jones behind. So down they go into the hairpin. Mac is now braking hard. And I think he actually escaped. I think he turned down the inside while they were bumping each other. So I'm not really sure whether there was further contact in the front. I couldn't really see that from that angle. But the result was, the net result was a car park spin for Tim Slade. Cam Waters has just equaled, this is bizarre, I've never ever seen it before. So two cars currently hold the fastest lap. So Van Gisbergen's done a 1 minute 3.7101 and Cam Waters, you can see on screen folks, has done a 1 minute 3.7101. To four so decimal that, places. You get two and a half points each for that. <laughs> You're so cynical. That's weird. Or I do you get five each? I would have said five each. Well, depends on your, whether you're a glass half full or empty. But uh, that's weird. But to be able to have the cars match their pace to the 10 one thousandth of a second, yeah. that's odd. <laughs> one second margin between Van Gisbergen and Mostert. Mark? Hey, boys, I just had a chat to Richard Harris, uh, Will Davison's engineer, and you're 100% right. He also agrees with you, boys, that uh, Shane... Uh, Shane Van Gisberg and set Will nicely up down there intentionally. And you know, look what he did with Anton Di Pasquale, that last lap at Townsville. I mean, this is this racing IQ, this racing brain we talk about. It's magnificent. Yeah, he's pretty shrewd when it comes to commanding things from that seat. He's got a 1.1 second margin now. And uh, he made life hard for probably his closest rival. Did nothing wrong, drove down the inside, and then 
Probably gave him seven eighths of a car width on the way out, but that's all he had to do. And then that made Will vulnerable then to an angry pack. And you can now see the outcome. So Will's sitting 3.6 seconds off the lead of this fellow, and he's sitting in fourth position now. And the problem is, if you will, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, because if you follow him and you go, and you drive under his rear bumper all the way into that corner, someone else will take the incentive and go, it looks pretty inviting around the outside. So it would have been Cam Waters or Chaz Bostick would have tried the same stunt. So and this is one of the things when you take into account, people often debrief these incidents in great detail, but you've got to understand that it all happens in a tiny fraction of a second. And the competitive nature of it is that if you don't pull the trigger, there's another 20 odd fellows behind who will. will. Yeah. But I, but I think if Will had his time again, he would have been far more forceful in the braking area to close down on Shane getting to the corner. So once that Shane had invited him to round him up, essentially, then what he's got to do is force him narrow and force him down into the apex. What he did was probably race a little control gentlemanly. Teams, race control all teams, five second time penalty, car 35 for a driving infringement. And that's Todd Hazelwood. So they're handing out five-second penalties like jelly beans at the moment. So that's now Courtney, Randall, and Hazelwood. So there's little yellow five seconds against their name. There's one for you, one Someone for you, you, and another for you. <laughs> so, yeah, I think the only way that Will could have countered that was to, to close him up and make contact with him on the way to the corner. And then he would have been on the inside, coming out of turn eight, he would have been on the inside for turn nine and turn 10, which would have made a massive difference to Van Gisbergen at that point. And that's why it, it's enticing down there on the outside of the hairpin, because it does give you a priority line into the next left-hander if you get away with it. You've got to have enough authority with the car. You have to be far enough in front of your opponent to be able to make it work right when you get to turn 11, which is when it gets really exciting. That's the that's, final turn. That's right. So, cut up to 34 in the foreground, Jack LeBron and Nick Perkett. A little bit of bump and grind happening there in that hairpin that we were just describing. They're battling at the moment. control all teams to assist you. There will be no variation to the time certain. Time certain will remain 41 laps or one lap after 13.58. And it's currently 13.37 local time. So no variation to the time certainty. Now, Cam Waters has come into the pit lane in the monster car. And the reason why it's important for the teams to know that is that it plays into their strategy planning. Great stop. No, that looks no. pretty good. Well, that stop. I haven't looked at all at the stops because I'm still boggled by everything else that's gone on out there at the moment. But we've only had a handful, obviously, stops so far. We'll keep a bit of an eye on whether or not that was uh, down in the low threes, but that's... So on our estimate, we think that that's going to shorten up the race to the tune of about four laps by holding the same time certain. Now, 4.2 seconds, actually looked quicker than that, 4.2 seconds for Cam Waters. Riding here with Nick Perkat, final corner coming up. So just fans that throttle, gives a little breath just to get the thing to turn. Mostert and Davison now responding as well. That brings Heimgartner up into second. Okay, Reminder, swing in. Once you get past the mini, boom. Line yourself under the board, left-hand side. Clear in the lane. Voice of Anthony McDonald. Nice. Oh, Percat off, up against the fence at turn four. Uh, and uh, left side only for Will Davison. OK, mate, come on in. We'll clear the bay for you. And Grant McPherson's on the radio talking to Nick Perkett. Race control to all teams. Race control all teams. 15 second time penalty. Car 55 for a driving infringement. That's for Thomas Randall. And that'll be for Tim Slade. <laughs> so you were just talking about all the penalties. He had five seconds against him already. So now all that's happened, he's gone to 20. More jelly beans. <laughs> So Scott Pye here in behind Will Davison and Heimgartner and Van Gisbergen now responding out of the lead of the race. Cam Waters is on target to get the fastest lap of the race. By the way, we resolved the problem of who gets the points because 
while we were looking the other way, Scott Pye got the fastest lap, and I think Cam Orders is about to nick it from him. So the jointly shared quick lap, not an issue. Another great stop there by Heimgartner. Brett Jones Racing have been so good with their pit stops. Give you some numbers again in a second, but that looked very smart. Three point seven seconds for Shane. That's the best we've seen today. So the Red Bull Ampol Racing men and women doing a fine job down there to process that car in a hurry. And Heimgartner was a three point four seconds, so they nicked three tenths of a second stationary. So that's very impressive. They've been good at that. They dropped down the Pertec pit stop challenge standings. I asked Brad Jones about that earlier in the weekend. And he goes, yeah, they paid the money at the final. <laughs> and he's been pretty good at grabbing that over the years. He has. <laughs> and that final, by the way, uh, is at Bathurst. So let's just see what happens here now. Jack LeBrock is actually our leader. And uh, two-thirds of the field, maybe a little bit more, have actually now done their compulsory stop. And that slight undercut with Mostert has given him a yield. So this is Percat, who's out of control at the change of direction from two to three, and then fires wide. Once it was out and sideways, he couldn't gather it back up and slides off gently into the tyre barrier there at turn four. So not a lot of damage. This is on board now. Watch the oversteer. Sideways, runs out of lock, doesn't really slow that much. Straightens the wheel up. Clever. So he actually went into the tyres with the wheel straight, so that doesn't incur the same steering damage as if he had all that lock still on it. He actually straightened the wheels up right before he got to the fence and went bang into the fence nice and square, and then was able to drive out of there. And for James Golden, guys, a bit of a slow stop on that one. Lost about five to six seconds with a slow gun, so his entire time in pit lane tallied nearly 60 seconds. Hey, how's the military-type discipline and professionalism of these teams? Will Davison came down the pit lane. Look at the guys. That's the pit crew in behind there, working on the car, bolting on bits. They're soaring off bits. They ran out here, did his pit stop in 3.9 seconds, shipped him, straight back in, straight back to work. Very good. Yeah, excellent, isn't it? Bryce Fullwood and James Courtney now coming into the lane as well. James is going to have to serve that five-second penalty in the process. Picking up on Shane Van Gisbergen, so Mark made the point about that margin closing down slightly. And this is the weight. James Courtney, so that penalty now served. And uh, what is that official margin between Van Gisbergen and, and Chaz? It's one second at the moment. So he definitely got a benefit from the undercut. I don't sense that Chaz has got enough pace at the moment to... That was tight. That was tight. To really disturb Shane's rhythm. It might be wrong. Brody Stecky is also coming into the pit lane now. Jack LeBrock, still our leader from Lee Holdsworth. Thomas Randall, who, when he comes in, has to sit there and wait for 20 seconds. Uh, Van Gisberg is currently on target for the quickest lap. Faster in the mid sector than anyone else, and the personal best in sector one. And the accumulation of those times is sufficient to potentially propel him to the top at the moment. It's been held by Cam Waters. What's James doing? I don't know. I thought he was headed for an early crossover into those early booms, but he's. I don't know what's happened there. It looked like he's ended up in the sort of furthest of the Tickford booms. I don't know, I couldn't work it out. Now Jack LeBrock's coming into the pit lane from the lead of the race. Van Gisbergen will turn lost at now 1.3 seconds. So he's made a little bit of ground just in the recent past as well. But you can see Chaz lurking in the background. He's certainly not too far away. And then tucked in behind them is Cam Waters. Uh, will Davis is 2.1 seconds further afield. Uh, in behind there is Will. You can see him in, in the red car just on the right-hand side of the screen there. Now. So that's the margin you can see now between the top end of town. I think what you'll find is that uh, Waters and Davison will definitely have steering damage after they collect with each other coming out of turn eight. So when Shane pulled that move and he went down the outside, Will, when Will tried to establish whatever gain was going to be made on the exit of the corner, he didn't have any road. He had a bucket load of wheel spin 
and the exchange, the, the wheel-to-wheel -wheel contact with Cam Waters is pretty significant. This is part of the 22nd Five, time four, penalty that three, Thomas Randall two, has incurred. One. So, yeah, so I think what you'll find is that SVG and Monster are in good order. Those cars are in good nick. But I think Waters and Davison will be hurt. It doesn't take much to bruise them. So if you think about it from a competitive point of view from Shane Van Gisbergen's seat, wasn't a bad manoeuvre when you not only managed to shuffle Will Davison out of your afternoon, or well, certainly the first portion of it, but you actually managed to impact the others as well, in this case, Cam Waters. Yeah. So yep. you get to two-for-one offer. And it does have a bearing on the Jason Richards Memorial in terms of those... those all right, Numbers. so Will Brown up and about. That's good. Here's the onboard. So, okay, so everybody's trying to figure out what to do to get around. So this is Mark Winterbottom up on the outside. Will try to get down the inside. A bit of the messiness came from Deeper Squally in the middle of the road. Here we are at turn two. Okay, yeah, he's just ended up. Ooh. Oh, that's Ouch. a bell ringer. My ribs are hurting just looking at it. So, uh, there. Yeah, yeah. Got Will right now, guys. It's the first time he's had a chance to see it. First time any of us have seen it. Can you just talk us through it from your point, mate? Yeah, I think you can see it from there. Winterbottom wasn't happy from the corner before and put me off, but uh, that was the biggest hit I've ever had. It was uh, some of them you're not too bothered about, but that was a pretty big hit, you know, go, going in at that speed. I knew I was screwed, going to hit the side of the uh, wall and, uh, yeah, got out of the car and I was pretty badly winded than that, but uh, feeling all right now, just a bit sore down my left side. And the car, obviously, that's it for today. I can swear you'd know what I'd say. It's uh, it's rooted. It's uh, it's done. So you know we've we've screwed a, rooted a supercar. Um, hopefully we get another one. You know all sorted for Bathurst. But you can obviously see what happened. It's uh, it is pretty disappointing. It was it was a big crash. That's for sure. Even the moment with Anton sitting there was pretty close. Yeah, it was hectic on that first lap. You know it wasn't too bad till here, but um, pretty much you're about to see it where he. Uh, Everyone goes too wide three and knows what the consequences are if you put someone off like that. And look what he did. Hope he comes down and says something. OK, mate. Thanks for the chat. Yeah, so Will Brown pretty animated. So uh, he's been run out of road there by Frosty. And uh, that's fired him heavily. I mean, the good news is that Will looks like he's all 100% other than the fact that he's cranky. So watch this. Out to the critical point And there's not a... Car width. No, there's not a car width. That's you finished off the sentence for me. The other thing I detected when we first picked up Will, so I couldn't figure out exactly what had gone on with 5 and 55 with Courtney and with Randall, but there was a little glimpse off his camera of them scampering down the back when the deeper squally thing was happening. So that's the reason why James Taylor gave them the five seconds because they went straight down the back and therefore made a, made a gain. There was a lot to unpack in all that. And a uh, yeah, pretty awkward set of circumstances and a very heavily damaged car, so we're not going to see Will Brown for the afternoon. Meantime, the reason for a lot of the congestion was as a result of the Deep Pasquale and the Stinky incident. No further action taken by race control over that one, but they're working flat out inside the garage. Dick Johnson racing at the moment, trying to rectify that car, and obviously the team will keep us up to speed on that. Back in the real world, it's 1.1 seconds between Van Gisbergen and Mostert. Lee Holdsworth just coming into the pit lane and Van Gisbergen has the fastest lap of the race and therefore the bonus five points if it stays that way. He's only taken an available 100 points so far. The fastest laps, he's taken 60 of them thus far. So 60% of the available points, the fastest laps through the course of what has been a comprehensive performance in 2022. Very strong. Van Gisbergen. It's 1.2 seconds up the road from Mostert, who is then 1.7 seconds up the road from Cam Waters, and two and a half seconds in front of Davis. And around the outside, Slate gets down the inside. There's no future in trying to get around the outside of turn one there. It's on the dirty side of the road and as soon as you get a little bit wide there you just you can't maintain control of the car and you end up in the weed you end up in the grass 
and there's a consequence. We have to try to rejoin in the middle of that chicane at turn two, three, and often you make contact being totally out of control. So 250k there, the Bunnings trade speed trap on the way into turn one. One of the great character corners at this venue. We talk about it a lot in terms of the approach speed and how fast it is and what the bumps do and how much the cars slide around and move about. Dunlop tyres loaded for a long time in that corner. Neil was talking about it before. It's 5.4 seconds, so five and a half seconds of load on the tyre sliding through that fast right-hander. Correcting the slide the whole time. I think Shane's controlling this at the moment. The buffer's staying pretty static. Uh, he's got those faster slap points and he doesn't need to hustle any harder. That's the top three that you're looking at at the moment. We've got those Pertec pit stop times up there for you as well. Uh, pretty impressive time again by Brad Jones Racing when you consider the 3 1 for Bryce Forward and the 20 kilos of supercar rim and Dunlop tyre and wrangling the gun, the rattle gun in the process. That's a fairly decent gap from Waters back to Davison. And I think, based on the fact that Will looked very racy early on and his relative pace at the moment, I think you're right, Mark, there'd be a chance that there's a bruise on car number 17 and possibly car number six. So that's Will Davison and Cam Waters. So now look at the movers and shakers, must it? up three spots, Waters up four spots, Heimgartner up four spots, Winterbottom you know, is in strife. Ooh, what was that? Oh, that? It's a wing off the... Oh, I thought it was a wing. It's not. It's a door. Skin. Oh, maybe it's a door. It actually, it's, like yeah, a it's a door, door, door so, skin. Yeah. yeah, door skin on the Boost Mobile Commodore of Brody Kostecki. That would have been a little bit of the bumping and, and grinding out of the original incident with Anton, wouldn't it? Yes. A composite panel and it's just off to the side of the road on the approach into turn one i doubt whether they'll do much about it here's the replay it, it caught my eye and luckily it's just parked up there on the grass so that will be as a result of the contact with anton earlier on on that opening lap luckily it didn't jump over the fence there thankfully Beautiful images. And the other thing that takes your eye when you look at these replays is just how much movement is in the cars and the tyre distortion down here at Turn 1 as well. James Courtney, who served a penalty because he ran down the back straight and kept going through that chicane to avoid all of the back straight chaos on the opening lap. He's tangled up here with Tim Slow, who we also saw pointing the other way. And there's a gigantic chew mark in the back of the cool drive car as well. So balance of that car will be disturbed a little bit so this has been a wild ride for a lot of cars out there there's a lot of damage and an unusual race just the rhythm of it's been very strange hasn't it the number of people that have had to serve penalties so we're looking at scott pies putting on a fine performance here sitting in fifth position and uh, so we've got kiwis in position number one and in position number six chris pitten further down the order in position number 25 I think Scott Pye is going to have to work on his consistency in qualifying because he's been six for all three races. Yeah. <laughs> if he's got the best from the car at every point, he's done a pretty good job over the weekend, Scott Pye, with Richard Holway. He's battling away there with young Andre Heimgartner. It wasn't an emotional yesterday for Andre to get onto the podium and do such a fantastic job in front of a home crowd. Kostecki's done a good job today, Neil. He's been battling with Brock Feeney the whole time. Brock now has a lunge. And he's given him space. Oh, they've both given each other only just enough. Now is where it gets a bit sticky. Brock trying to stay up on the outside. This is where Winterbottom and Brown came unstuck. And Brown ended up in the wall. And then Brock pops out the other side here in control of that one. A nice little bit of respect being shown by both those boys. James Golding lurking in the background. He's been strong this weekend in the subway entry. Premier higher entry. So these guys, it's a bit of a mixed up field at the moment when you look at the likes of... 
Scott Pye in fifth, Heimgart in sixth. It's quite a good move here. The Bunnings trade power pass for Brock Feeney, who sort of fainted a little and then fired down the inside. Jake probably gave him a little bit too much room. And then they had a little bit of side-to-side -side contact as they dodge and car themselves out of turn eight. And then this is brave. So we've seen how it can go wrong today, that move. He's able to get around the outside. Nice respect by both drivers. They're two young guys fighting hard, but also with a degree of professionalism at a spot where you can have big consequences. They got away with that one nice pass. So we're calling on the radio now four to go. Even though we're showing 41 laps, we won't make it. And it's 1.7 seconds now. Van Gisbergen over Mostert. In what's been a, a wild afternoon, I suspect that the final instalment later this afternoon will be much the same. Partial open wheeler for Brody Kostecki through turn one. Dorsky missing off the boost mobile entry, and that's as a result of the crunching with Anton Di Pasquale on the opening lap. Touch the mini notes about it, young man. Yeah. Yeah. So what does this do in Jason Richards' memorial land? Because another five points on top of the win for Van Gisbergen, but he starts in eighth in the race this afternoon. So he's got a lot of work to do. Will Davison will be on the front row of the grid. And Will got the majority of the points yesterday. So there's a lot to play out here. Will Davison still got away with a fourth position in this race. Ben Gisbergen with the hopes of New Zealand on his shoulders. Rebounded tremendously from yesterday. And it's been a pretty tough weekend for Jack LeBrock in the truck assist issue. Had that power steering failure yesterday, today, sort of right front suspension failure. So that car is in the garage and he is over and out. Thanks for the update, Bree. So we're coming up to the time certain moment at 58 minutes past the hour locally. And uh, once we click over that, which is about 35 seconds away now, uh, we'll go one lap on top of that and uh, bring out the chequered flag and it's going to resolve in favour of Shane Van Gisbergen and that's going to move his championship tally this year on to 17 victories, just one shy of what Scott McLaughlin achieved in a special record year and for Van Gisbergen it's just further confirmation in his march towards the Repco Supercars Championship of 2022 and done very shrewdly in his battle early on in the day. You know, he put paid to the assault from Will Davison and probably effectively Cam Waters in one manoeuvre. So he's got total control of everything out there. Remember, Auckland, in terms of his original location, is the hometown. And so you can imagine how special this is going to be when he can put all those points in his back pocket, including the bonus points for the fastest lap once again. And Mark's been talking about how many of those he's owned so far this year. So this should Race be the last lap. All teams confirming the leader has just commenced the last lap. That's Taylor confirming that from race control. So he has been unbelievable in the recent past, hasn't he, Mark? Like it wasn't a strong run for him yesterday, but I'd look down the little sheet that I've got of achievements in the recent past. He was a winner both days in Townsville. He was a winner all three days at Tail and Bend, and he was a winner twice out of three occasions when we got to Sandown. And he's about to be a winner one more time. So, and he gets to run again in New Zealand in a couple of weeks in a very special opportunity in a round of the World Rally Championship. That's his engineer, Andrew Edwards. And so uh, there'll be a lot of talk and a lot of pressure on him for at least a couple more weeks, and then. We're getting set for the Repco Bathurst 1000. But the focus right now, one corner to go. And this is going to be a very popular victory. Shane Van Gisbergen notches up a perfect win for the second race of the ITM Auckland Super Sprint in New Zealand. Stitched it up nicely and gets the bonus points along the way. <laughs> Uh, 
Great job. And you can see the crowd reaction. You can see also the team reaction. Beautiful drive. Able to put a very astute manoeuvre together down at turn eight. So the fans are up coming onto the straight there. There was not a New Zealander, not a customer in this precinct, not standing to attention to celebrate one of their own, the man that's dominated this series. Coming to the weekend with a 500 point lead. There's our podium. Shaman Gisberg and Chaz Mostert and Cam Waters. So that's going to be 71st victory notched up in his expanding CV yep. for Shane Van Gisbergen. So congratulations to Shane on a fine performance this afternoon and set that one up nicely from qualifying. He's got more work ahead of him later this afternoon, though, because he hasn't qualified nearly as well for our final race ever for supercars at this location. He'll start out of eighth position, but that doesn't actually matter too much to him right at the moment. So big reception, big moment. Twice he's won the Jason Richards Memorial Trophy. He did it in 2016. Did it last time out in 2019. And no matter who you barrack for, you have to acknowledge the prowess of this young Kiwi. Pertec Victory Lane belongs to him today, 33 years of age. And he is not only emphatically our championship leader, but he has blown them away in our second race here in Pookie this weekend. Very impressive. So that's going to further extend his points lead. And he'd be in pretty decent shape when it comes to the Jason Richards trophy. Shane Van Gisbergen and Chaz Moster have had some epic battles over the years. It wasn't much that Chaz could do about that one in the end. It was 2.3 seconds, so yeah. it was a comfortable margin for Shane. He strolled home and uh, he did all that fine work in qualifying. And then really in the early laps of the restart, he put a seal on it right there and then. Shane Van Gisbergen over Chaz Moster, Cam Waters, Will Davison, and I think Waters and Davison's car is probably partially bruised. Pye's done a very good job this afternoon for finishing in fifth position and had a great battle with Heimgartner. Reynolds, Feeney, Jake Kostecki, notable performance for young Jake in position number nine. James Golding, position number 10. Another fine drive for the youngster in the subway entry. But right now, a lot of applause being pointed in the direction of this man, Shane Van Gisbergen. A great drive this afternoon, Jess. Well, there was no way he wasn't going to be here in the Pertec Victory Lane today. Congratulations, Shane. You're now leading the JR Memorial Trophy tilt by four points. Check out the crowd. What does this one mean? Oh, I, I could see it when I got the start and then on that last lap, like, what a feeling. I'm going to miss this place. But um, next race is going to be hard off the back, but um, I'll try my best to get through. It was um, a bit crazy on that restart. I did everything I could to try to get going, but I was struggling with my tyres, and then once it cleared up, I was gone. So... Um, yeah, what a feeling. Thank you, everyone. Talk to us about how you had to hold your nerve through that one and what you were saying to yourself as the laps ticked down. And I'm sure you could see everybody on your feet in those closing laps. I oh, mean, I just want to do a burnout, but I got a race this afternoon. So, yeah, looked after it a bit and, um, yeah, hopefully get a chance tonight. But uh, we'll see. Thank you. Just, just give us some quick insight into what happened with Will Davison there when he was coming around the outside. Oh, he went off at the happen, but um, it was a good race. Chaz was going well. And, uh, yeah, good fun. Go and enjoy it. Thanks. And great to have Chaz Mostert back here on the podium at Pukekohe. You've made a bit of a habit of this over the years. How did this one feel today? There was plenty going on in those opening laps. Yeah, there was uh, a lot going on. It was obviously a pretty interesting race. Everyone was having a real dip out there. So, um, yeah, plenty of action. Put on a, a show for all the fans here. But um, I tell you what, I haven't heard a crowd like this since, like, 2014 Bathurst. So you guys should be real proud of yourself with the energy you guys are showing out here. So um, must be these Kiwi drivers keep winning all the time. So it gives you guys something to cheer about. But uh, we'll see how we go in the next one. We'll start a bit further back. But just super pumped to get a trophy for WAU. They're try, trying really hard at the moment. And... Um, yeah, just want to say hi to my girlfriend. She's out here crowd. She's from New Zealand and her whole uh, family here, about 20, is here too. So I feel like I'm a Kiwi, kind of. Go and soak up the moment. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Cheers.
Cameron Waters back on the podium here at Pukekohe today. It is his 12th podium for season 2022. How was that one out there? That was pretty hectic. Just talk to us from your point of view about what happened after the restart there. Uh, it was just chaos. So I knew I had my work cut out for me, you know, qualifying back in seventh, but I uh, made a few spots at the start and then a few spots after that uh, safety car restart. So, um, yeah, the car was pretty pretty speedy. Probably not quite as quick as them, but quicker the rest of them. So, um, yeah, just got to get a good start. The next one's starting off too. Got to maximise it and try and get a win. Did you have contact there with Will Davison? Yeah, we kind of interlocked wheels as he come back on. So um, I tried to leave enough room and, um, you know, sometimes the wheels interlock. So, um, yeah, kind of cut my tyre a little bit and bent my steering, but it was okay. Didn't hurt us too much. Do you make any changes to the car? Is there still more pace in this Mustang? Yeah, there's a little bit of pace left in it. So um, we missed the mark in qualifying, made it better for qual three, and it was a step back to what we needed then in that race. So, um, you know, we've learned a little bit. we just got to mesh it all together now and uh, get a good start and let's try and win a race. Well done. Good luck for later this afternoon. Thank you. I just want to thank all the Pukekohe management for the racetrack and um, all the officials at Pukekohe. They've been around for a long time and, um, yeah, it doesn't go unnoticed what they do. Thanks, Cam. Thanks. Scott Pye brought the new Long Commodore home in fifth in that one. And, Scotty, you look like you worked pretty hard out there today. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, mentally was the biggest thing because you've got a guy right behind you. In this track, if you don't make any mistakes and the car's all right, you can hold them off. But, yeah, it was uh, Andre breathing down my neck the whole race. But that's, I mean, it's so much fun. This place, it's like you can't, can't button off anywhere. It's like a bull ring. So slightly disappointed. The, the start was good, and then I got muscled out on the outside of, of Anton, I think it was. So I lost a couple spots there. But all in all, I mean, it, just got to keep this momentum going and um, build on it is all we can do. Tenth yesterday, fifth in that one. You start this afternoon's race from sixth. Yep. Your chance to stick it on the podium? Yeah, triple six. I think it's like, was that the devil's number or something? I maybe embrace the devil, but I don't know, man. We just need to keep our head down, keep scoring points. It's been a tough season so far, so the best thing is keep finishing races, do every lap and improve the car we got. And uh, the big one, Bathurst, coming up. Home race for me, Adelaide, to finish the year. It's a good time for, for things to come to fruition. Solid weekend so far. Good luck today, this afternoon. Thanks, mate. James Golding, second top ten in a row here for you in the subway entry. Just give us the race from your point of view. Yeah, it was a pretty hectic one, that one. The first uh, start, obviously, we had that big incident over the back and, um, yeah, just just missed it, so that was lucky. And, yeah, we had a pretty good restart. We were pretty aggressive at the start, so I managed to get Brody and, and then sort of settle into the race from there. I knew the car had pretty good speed, so um, settled in. We um, we had a little bit of a slow pit stop, so that probably hurt us a little bit at the end, Had prop having to get those cars at the end. But... Um, yeah, all in all, still a strong result and looking forward to the next one. We spoke yesterday about your progress, the team's progress. Are your expectations starting to shift now that you've had these consistent top tens? Oh, certainly, yeah. As, as, I mean, as soon as you get one, as soon as you're up there in practice, your expectations move. So, yeah, I'm happy we're consistently in there too. It's 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 difficult, you know, this, this championship so competitive and we've seen it in qualifying. We didn't quite get the setup right and, and it hurt us for the next race. We're starting a little bit further back, so... Yeah, it's, it comes down to hard work and, and we're all still pushing forward, so that's what's making a difference at the end of the day. No worries. Thanks so much, James. We'll see you this afternoon. Thank you. Cheers. Second race of the weekend in New Zealand, the 28th of our championship season, and Shane Van Giesbergen started from the pole position alongside him, Brock Feeney, and it was a frantic opening lap. Good start by Shane. So he ticked the first box that really mattered most, and that set things up. But then all of a sudden, all hell broke loose on the exit of Turn 6. Brody Kostecki and Anton Di Pasquale tangling big damage on the Shelby Power Racing entry, unfortunately. That's what it looked and sounded like, looking over the left shoulder of Di Pasquale. And then that triggered some subsequent action as well. A couple of drivers had to go straight ahead down the back. And then because of the congestion, Mark Winterbottom and Will Brown got together here at Turn 10. Frosty didn't leave quite enough room on the right-hand side, and that fired Will Brown into the wall and delayed the race. In fact, it was suspended as a result of it while they put the big concrete block back in position. And then a restart where Shane Van Gisbergen held them very long and very late, and then in a very wily move here at Turn 8. He forced Will Davis to try and take the high line, and that invited Chas Bostert to make a spot, which he did. It tangled Will Davison with Cam Waters and delayed Will, who had a pretty quick car and it effectively let Van Gisbergen off the hook. So he scooted away. He's put together his 17th victory of the 22 Repco Supercars Championship season and he moves his career tally on to a staggering 71 victories. Unbelievable performance and just to rub salt, fastest lap of the race as well. Winner bottom. 
Williams out of the Irwin Racing Commodore. First thing he asked me was, Will, OK? You've had your first look at the incident now from there. From his point of view, what do you, how do you feel about the whole thing now? Yeah, oh, it looks bad. It always looks bad on footage when someone ends up like that. So, um, unfortunately, with the footage, it doesn't show the turn four get hit, turn six get hit, turn nine get hit. You like, like the concertina and everything going on to get there. But, um, uh, yeah, I think we're going too wide. I think, um, obviously, you feel like there's more room there. I feel like his front wheel hit my back and lifted. And um, it's not intentional at all. So, that's yeah, it's a bad visual to watch, you know. But, um yeah, it's always hindsight, isn't it? Unfortunately for him, you know, I can see why he'd be angry and disappointed. So, um, yeah, I've got to drive through. Um, you know, it's, it's hard when someone's not side by side, a little bit different. So, um, anyway, he coppered and glad he's OK, and that's, that's the main thing. Will was obviously pretty fired up when I talked to him. He said that he wanted to have a chat to you about it. Do you feel like that's warranted? Oh, you can if you want. Yeah, obviously, um, uh, they can, yeah. I saw um, there was a few of them in pit lane carrying on a bit but um, nothing's intentional in this sport that's the thing you know like it's you race hard and um, you know it doesn't show getting drilled at the hairpin by him and turn six getting drilled by him but it shows the aftermath and that's that's what looks bad so um, not intentional and glad he's okay and yeah I'm sure we can chat about it no worries yeah, mate, I appreciate the chat yeah cheers Tom. By the sounds of that, though, Greg Murphy, it doesn't sound like Mark Winterbottom is possibly going to say what Will Brown is hoping to hear, if um, you know what I mean. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is a real tricky one. Uh, looking at the, the angles and bits and pieces, and I don't know if he hit the kerb or not. We haven't got a shot of that. If, if Mark Winterbottom mm. actually hit the inside there, because there was a kerb there as you turn in as well, the way the car sort of moved across is, I mean, there's so many factors, but he did run him out of road. And uh, the consequence for that is is one incredibly badly damaged Erebus Commodore. I mean, it, I've looked underneath it just uh, a minute ago. Right. And it is in, yeah, probably irreparable state, I would have thought. So um, massively challenging. So here we go. This is all action. The in-car here. Mark came across very defensive. They've definitely got together. I, that's hard to sort of judge as anything other than good racing, to be honest, I think. And then here, there's the kerb there. Did he hit? I think he might have touched the kerb. I, I, I don't doubt it's not. In, I do not no. doubt there, it was not intentional. He's bounced across. I reckon he's hit the inside of the kerb there, and that's fired him across. They are racing very hard, but this is a dangerous spot to be running someone out of road unintentionally. At any case, I cannot believe that didn't dig in and roll, actually, as well. That is, that is a huge, huge impact, as the boys talked about. Look at those concrete walls. How many are they? Five tonne each? Look at the car. I mean, well, you just said you've crawled out from underneath it, and it's uh, it, in it, not a good way. It, it, what it has proven, again, is the safety yep. of, a, of a modern supercar and, and what all, the, all the, uh, the development and technology that is built in. Here they are having a chat now. Live, live pictures out of the pit lane, confrontation between Mark Winterbottom and Will Brown. You can see Will Brown is absolutely animated. Barry Ryan standing there with him part of this conversation. They're not agreeing. Will looks really emotional, upset. It's being marched out of the garage at Sport. Can't even imagine that. And maybe, and maybe some of the the chat that oh, and it's unnecessary though from Barry to do that. But uh, uh, I mean, they've got a red car, an absolute dead set red car, and and um, you know someone's walking away from here as an Erebus and Will Brown with uh, a lot to show for a weekend, and uh, you know on a weekend we should be celebrating. So you, this is all part of the deal, but. Yep. There's a lot of frustration and anger in this one. And, okay, uh, that's so not going to get agreed upon. Let's put this into context. So we're only a couple of weeks away from the biggest race of the year, the Bathurst 1000. That car is totaled. Is it repairable at all once they get it back to the workshop? I don't think they've got time. I don't think they can. I, I would say and the, the problem with this is, is you take a quick look at it and you go, go wow. It's when you start taking things apart right. and you find more and more and more. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't see how. So, that do they revert is. to their spare car? How many spare cars have they got? Because they're also actually working on a car for you as a wild card at Bathurst. That correct? is, the, that is the spare car. Your car is the spare car. 
Yeah, that's the only, that's the only other, other one that's yeah, the no, yeah. Right, so this impact here today for Will Brown could very well have ramifications on your wildcard entry. Well, I, I'm looking at it right now thinking that's, uh, that is pretty much dead set uh, an issue, yes, very much. Wow. Because we, we were always aware that the, the car that we had um, run for Ere that we were running as part of uh, the Erebus uh, supply of a car for us was you know that was their that was their third car. So um, yes, it's a uh, interesting the way things work out, Jess, at the moment. So there's a lot to be unravelled and course. unpacked, um, and they will be doing a lot of. I suppose analysing of, of the of that chassis and it's going to need it, but it is it is not a happy happy car. So. Wow! So from one complicated situation that's just involved into an entirely different complicated situation, hasn't it? And of course you'll keep us up to date with exactly what's going on, whether or not. In fact, you'll be there. I'm sure they'll be able to work out something. Let's hope so. Of course. Yeah, yeah. You haven't worked this hard for 12 months. No, and a lot of people have worked very hard. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Wow. Well, that's a developing story here at Pukekohe Park Raceway, but huge damage for Will Brown in that race. And you saw there live pictures out of the pit lane, the confrontation between he and Mark Winterbottom. As that unfolds, of course, you'll see the very latest right here on Fox Sports. We do have to take a really quick break, but we're counting down to the final race ever here at Pukekohe Park Raceway. The on-track action continues when we come back. And don't forget, Formula One is at Monza tonight and you'll catch all the live and exclusive action right here on Fox Sports.